Hello. So, my name is Varun Sahani, and I'll be presenting two lectures uh, on dark matter, dark energy, and the cosmic web. My first lecture today will be on dark matter and the cosmic web. Hope you all enjoy it. So, as you all know, you know, the universe is really mysterious because it's got a lot of dark stuff out there. By dark stuff, I mean stuff that doesn't shine, you know. Like, you know, the stars shine, the galaxies shine, you know, some of the planets shine, of course, with reflected light. But 96% of the universe does not shine at all. And we believe, furthermore, that this dark component of the universe is not one component, but perhaps it's made of two components. One of them is called dark matter, and the other is called dark energy. So let me begin. You see, cosmology these days has a standard model. Right? This standard model may or may not be true. We are all testing different bits of it. But the standard model consists of various parts. We believe the universe right at the very beginning Right, about 10 to the power minus 33 seconds after the Big Bang, went through a period of called inflation, when the universe expanded really rapidly, very rapidly. And this phase was extremely important for structure formation because it gave rise to the initial seeds of structure. These seeds later grew and grew and grew and grew in the course of 13 billion years to form what is now known as the cosmic web. Now, both dark matter, of course, the cosmic web consists primarily of baryons. By baryons, I mean protons. I mean, electrons are, of course, bound to them. They are leptons. So you've got a lot of neutral hydrogen there. You've got stars, right? And they, all these things appear to reside on something known as the cosmic web. But the dark sector also plays a very key role in the formation of the cosmic web. For instance, dark matter speeds up structure formation whereas dark energy slows it down. Now, dark energy and inflation both have one thing in common, that the pressure of what is driving these two components is negative. Now, this is a very startling and exotic possibility because as you know, you know the pressure in your pressure cooker at home or the pressure in the sun is positive, right? You don't encounter negative pressure in every day to day life. Nevertheless, it appears that, you know, the universe has some exotic components and they may have strong negative pressure. So let's proceed. As you know, you know, galaxies are the building blocks of the universe. There are you know, possibly an infinite number of galaxies in the universe. If the universe is infinite in space, then definitely there are more than there are an infinite number of galaxies. And they come in a bewildering and very beautiful series of sizes and shapes. This is beautiful, my favorite. You know, edge on spiral, right? Look at this beautiful galaxy. And all these galaxies are distributed in space, you know, and this is a very nice picture of the large scale distribution of galaxies. You know, this was made by the Lick Observatory Survey many decades ago. And this is a projection, right? You see many, many galaxies superimposed, about a million galaxies in the survey. And you see that this resembles a frothy surface, right? In the regions of greater dark brightness and lesser brightness. You know, these are the voids. And this resembles surface of water, actually. You know, you see water, you know, it has this, this texture, right? And there is a very deep relationship between gravitational clustering and, and you know, the flow of, of light through water. I'll come to that later when I discuss this in more detail. So one of the beautiful things about the universe realized um, you know, almost exactly a hundred years ago, right, by Hubble, was that galaxies move away from each other. And the further galaxies are, the faster they move away from each other. And this is known as Hubble's law. So V is equal to H times R. This is a crude approximation, you know. It's not the exact Hubble's law. Hubble's law, the exact one is given here at below. But, you know, it's a nice uh, rule for, you know, imagination, right? And H is your Hubble parameter, which varies with time. At the present time, it's about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Right? So this is the rate of 
expansion of our universe, the present rate of expansion. So this is a nice cartoon with which you can imagine cosmic expansion. You've got galaxies here moving away from each other. And if you kind of take this movie and play it back in time, you will find that these galaxies at one time were very close to each other, right? Up here, they were really close. So they would have smashed into each other. So this picture tells you immediately that galaxies could not have existed as individual entities all the way back in time, right? They should have been a formation scenario. So here's an expanding balloon analogy. You know, if you, if you like to think of space-time as a rubber, then imagine, you know, the universe expanding, right? It was, it was small initially, these yellow blobs of galaxies, and it's large now, and these galaxies have moved away from each other. And the wiggles here are, are wave, waves of photons, right? You know, and at earlier times, the wavelength was smaller. Then as the universe expanded, the wavelength became larger, the photons redshifted. Today, these photons appear to us as the cosmic microwave background. It has a temperature of almost three degrees Kelvin. So, galaxies must have evolved from smaller entities, and the preferred evolutionary scenario is that galaxies form from tiny fluctuations existing over 10 billion years ago. These fluctuations grew over time and several billion years after the Big Bang, they were large enough to form stars and galaxies. Now, evidence for this evolutionary scenario comes from the cosmic microwave background. Cosmic microwave background, as you've heard already from other lectures, is light coming to us from when the universe was very, very young. When the universe was only about 100,000 years old, it emitted this light. And this light today comes to us and it's very interesting to see that this light is not perfectly smooth, but it has irregularities. And these irregularities can be expressed as temperature fluctuations of one part in about 100,000. And you can translate this very simply into fluctuations in the gravitational potential. So, you know, the gravitational potential has fluctuations of also one part in about 100,000. So these, these potential fluctuations later made, you know, matter aggregate towards each other, you know, you know, you see the potential, what happens to a gravitational potential on Earth, you throw a ball, it comes down, right? So things fall towards the Earth, right? Now this potential on, on Earth is very strong today. This potential is much smaller, but it has much longer time to grow, 10 billion years. So this is a picture we see, the universe had tiny fluctuations, they were Gaussian in nature, this is very important, and these fluctuations were tiny initially, so this is the fluctuation in the density, and later on they grew and gave rise to galaxies. So rho bar here is the mean density in the universe, right? And rho is the real density. Now, galaxies are believed to be the building blocks of the universe, right? And galaxies range from bewildering number of shapes and sizes. They have dwarf galaxies, and they are giant elliptics. 10 to the power of five difference between these two masses. So two questions naturally arise. Did galaxies always exist? Or did they come to existence? I believe we've already addressed this issue. You know, they did not always exist. They came into existence. And the second question is, are galaxies distributed randomly in space, somewhat like a Poisson distribution? Or does the galaxy distribution show a pattern? So is it this or is it this? And this was a very interesting question posed in the 70s, right? You know, those days, you know, the redshift of galaxies were not well known. It took a lot of time to measure a redshift, right? You know, you had to spend almost the entire night on a telescope to, to accurately measure a redshift, right? Fix of a, a you know, distant object. And then in the late 70s, these maps started appearing, right? This is known as the stick man, right? You can see this chap standing, right? With his, you know, hands spread. And they said, wait a minute, each dot here is a portal galaxy. They said, wait a minute, maybe galaxies have a pattern. But then immediately people said, well, maybe this is a selection effect. Why? Because our, our eye clearly likes to form patterns. Now, you know, you go out nowadays, you know, it's, it's a lockdown period, so there's less light pollution. <laughs> and you might be able to see Orion, a very beautiful constellation. Right? Now, I'm sure you'll agree that it takes a lot of imagination to make Orion look like a hunter, right? Yeah. But that's what the ancients did, right? They wanted to they wanted to map out these constellations, right? 
and and they found you know beautiful patterns right you know one was a hunter one was a bear you know one was a lion right leo leo the lion right so our clock i actually likes to form patterns all right so this is our iron and 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 there may be a selection effect bias here why because you know for about a few hundred thousand years we we lived in jungles right and so you ask you know and in jungles you have scary things like tigers right so if you didn't spot a tiger in a jungle if you couldn't match that pattern accurately if your neural network wasn't sensitive enough the tiger came and ate you and that's it it's over the selection effect right so all those people who could not spot tigers in jungles or snakes right <laughs> were you know eliminated and only that fraction of the population that was very adept at looking at patterns survived so this was the argument contra argument to saying whether this is real people said well maybe it is and maybe it's it's not but this answer was this this question was answered conclusively just a few years later when they found you know they went deeper and deeper they integrated deeper into this region of space and found wow this is certainly real right and now we believe that the universe the galaxies are not thrown down in random not in a poisson process but you they are they are clustered much like a you know what is called a cosmic web there are enormous entities called superclusters right you have you see some superclusters out here there's a huge one called the great wall right beautiful just around the stick man and there are regions which are completely empty of galaxies called voids so this is in the northern hemisphere galactic hemisphere this is in the southern one in another supercluster and another big void so naturally you know if matter is you know getting pushed into getting drawn into superclusters Uh, just from the conservation laws right there have to be empty regions right so 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 voids are complements of superclusters right so this this size of this one particular one in the northern hemisphere is about 100 megaparsec right that's 0.3 billion light years across it's really huge but this is not the largest object in the universe because about a couple of decades ago they found the sloan great wall right this is enormous right it's about 1.3 billion light years across and much larger than the 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 great wall so now it's widely recognized that we live on a cosmic web consisting of galaxies clusters of galaxies superclusters separated by empty regions it's called voids and this is what we believe happens this is a view from an n body simulation there are tiny fluctuations as i mentioned earlier 10 to one part in 10 to the power 5 and they grow 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 and give rise to the cosmic web which we see today so the universe started out being gaussian and ended up being very non gaussian and here is a simulation perhaps you've seen such simulations already it's an n body simulation showing that from random initial conditions you can actually get large scale structure okay so as i mentioned there's a very beautiful analogy between superclusters and water <laughs> you know now those of you swimming is banned these days but those of you who prior to the lockdown love to swim or had children who love to swim you would have gone to the pool and you would have seen these beautiful caustics in the distribution of light right now these caustics are regions where the light intensity is really bright okay and they are very similar to similar caustics namely superclusters that you see in the sky right now this is not just a, a lovely pictorial analogy it's a very precise analogy right and this was shown by zaldovich right and a very very versatile and, uh, and famous scientist he he drew an approximation which is very sim similar to the you know bending of light in geometric optics so if i have You know, a ray of light falling on the screen, right, at, at a point Q. Then, if it goes through just a simple lens, but not a plane lens, you know, it has some refractive index and it's slightly bent. Then it emerges 
on the screen, the location of the screen, which is a Z at a point R, and there'll be a deflection S times Z. Z is the distance to the screen, and S is the gradient of the thickness. So if there was no thickness, if it was just planar, this would be zero, and R would be just Q. This would just propagate here, but it's been deflected. And this deflection is what gives rise to this beautiful pattern of caustics. So this is an analogy from geometrical optics. There's no wave optics here. And in, in the Zaldovich approximation, it's very simple. The equation is identical. And again, R is Q plus D times V. D is related to the expansion of the universe. And V is just the gradient of gravitational potential. So the gravitational potential plays a key role in the making of these gravitational caustics, right? And it plays the same role as the thickness. So phi plays the same role as the thickness of the water or the plate of glass in optics. If those of you want to explore this analogy further, I, I, I would like to refer them to this very beautiful paper by Shandaran and Zaldovich, Reviews of Modern Physics, 1989. So currently, the precise location in terms of redshift of about a million galaxies is known, right? And it's up, it's, it's really big progress because it's up from about 2000, maybe two decades ago. At least in my lifetime, I've seen this progress. But the planned service should go much, much deeper. You know, they, they'll be able to map almost a billion galaxies. And this is going to come very soon. You know, and this will be very beautiful. But even now we have a very big surprise and that is that the visible matter, that entire cosmic web, accounts for only a small fraction of the total matter in the universe. Because as I told you in the beginning, most of the matter does not shine. It is dark and consists of dark matter and dark energy. Only 4%, 4 to 5% of the matter in the universe is in the form of stars, galaxies, and other baryonic objects. So here's the pie chart. I showed you this earlier. So dark matter, what is it? And where is it? These are the two questions that automatically arise. Right? right? Where is it? What is it? So there are three compelling reasons for the existence of dark matter. The first and foremost comes from galaxies. We believe galaxies are surrounded by a halo of dark matter. The second comes from clusters of galaxies. Clusters of galaxies are the largest concentrations, gravitationally bound concentrations in the they give very unambiguous results in favor of dark matter. The third is structure formation. Because if, if there is no dark matter, then this final stage is never reached. Right? The universe with today will look something like this. It will be frothy, but there will be no galaxies. Right? So let's go to each of these topics separately. So, you know, the, you cannot see dark matter, so you've got to be smart to infer its presence. Right? And you can do that because galaxies are not still, right? Like everything else in the universe, you know, galaxies are also in motion. And many galaxies show what is known as a rotation curve, right? Which means that different regions in the galaxy at different distances rotate at different rates. And the mass inside an orbit back can be found by noting the speed with which a star or some other object is rotating. So this is what you find. Right? This is what you actually do. Right? So supposing you, this is your galaxy, right? Imagine the center is somewhere here, right? In the origin. And so you use Kepler's law, right? Kepler's law is simply mv squared by r, right? The centripetal acceleration is related to the gravitational force, gmm over r squared. Small m cancels. So V is equal to square root GM, capital M, mass of the galaxy divided by R, R being the radius from the center. Now, what you find is that when you observe, you know, this is a theory and this is observations, right? This is observations. So when you see, probe this rotation curve close to the origin, right? You find it's rising. And this is, this is natural because the mass is growing. But now we come to the edge of the galaxy. And you would expect that since mass has become constant, the velocity will drop off like one over square root of r. This is what you expect. But 
lo and behold, what you actually see is that the rotation curve becomes constant. Right? Now, this was very unexpected. Right? When people did this measurements, they themselves were surprised. Right? And this mass difference right, between this observed curve and the expected curve is due to the presence of dark matter. Dark matter tells you that the mass doesn't fall off, it's actually growing. So here is a rotation curve from our neighbor, a dwarf galaxy M33. You know, this is what you would expect if the galaxy ended here, right? Would drop off. But look at this, the velocity keeps growing. Now you are 10 times further from the center here than here, and you are still seeing it grow. That's remarkable. This tells us that the galaxy is surrounded by a dark halo of something. Like we don't know what that something is, so we call it dark matter. And it's interesting that the ratio of dark to luminous matter actually increases as one moves from larger to smaller galaxies. In spiral galaxies and ellipticals, this ratio, mass to light ratio, is usually called is about 10, 10 to 20 times the solar value. And this ratio increases to several hundred for low surface brightness galaxies and dwarf galaxies. And in fact, dwarf galaxies are very interesting objects because some of them are dominated by dark matter, even in their central regions. And this rotation curve has been measured not for one or two galaxies, but for over a thousand galaxies. And so, you know, dark matter appears to be everywhere. Each galaxy appears to be surrounded by dark matter. So this was the first test I talked about, uh, you know, observational evidence for dark matter from an individual galaxy. Next, let's come to clusters. What are clusters of galaxies? Clusters of galaxies are the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe. Right? A rich cluster can contain over 10,000 galaxies. For instance, the coma cluster of galaxies, which is a cluster about 100 megaparsec away, contains 10 to the power 15 solar masses within a one and a half megaparsec radius. That's a very tight concentration of mass, very tight. Now, the point is that if this cluster is dynamically relaxed, right, it's a dynamically relaxed object, then one can use a virial theorem, which is a very beautiful theorem that relates the mean kinetic energy to the potential energy. K is equal to minus U by 2. Simple, right? Now you are observing the kinetic energy, right? Through the dispersion in the line of sight velocity, right? So you are actually observing this quantity, this is the kinetic energy, right? And you are inferring the potential, right? From this relationship. And what we found actually, it was discovered by Zwicky all the way back in 1933, was that kinetic energy was much, much larger than the potential energy. This can mean only two things that the clusters are not dynamically relaxed, that somehow they are all moving apart rapidly, or that there's a lot of mass out here that makes the potential energy grow. So that's the second evidence for dark matter. And it adds up to the fact that galaxies are individually surrounded by dark matter. Okay. Now, you know, being scientists, we love to debate, right? You know, well, maybe this is the dominant paradigm, right? Dark matter is a dominant paradigm, but hey, hang on. Maybe that's really not the case. Maybe you overlooked. And this was a point of view, a very interesting point of view, a contrarian point of view put forward by Professor Milgram long ago in 1983. Right? And he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, aren't you stretching things a little bit? In this entire argument, you are supposing two things. One is that the law of gravity holds, right? And the second is that the law of inertia holds, Newton's second law. And none of them has been actually tested beyond the solar system. So what gives you the right to make these two enormous extrapolations? So let's come back to the conventional approach. This is the conventional approach, right? F is equal to mg, the force due to the gravity sector, is equal to the inertial force, right? So these two accelerations are equal. This, you know, famous Galileo's experiment, you know, when he threw two balls from Leaning Tower of Pisa. I don't know if this is true or not, but that's like fable now, right? And these two turn out to be the same. And so you infer from here, 
uh, that you know v is equal to square root e naught. This is the main argument for dark matter. Now, now Milgram said he proposed something called MOND, modified Newtonian dynamics, right? And here he didn't modify the gravity sector, but he said, wait a minute, let's modify the dynamic sector, right? F may not be equal to ma. So what happens here is that F is equal to ma in regions of large accelerations. But in regions of small, very, very small accelerations, this law gets modified to Ma squared by A naught, right? So this, the gravity sector remains the same. So Mg becomes equal to Ma squared by A naught, Mm cancels again, but now you have a different equation, right? Relating A and G, this is the equation. You take the square root, you have A is equal to square root A naught by G, where A naught is a new constant. Its value is 10 to the minus 8 centimeters per second squared. This is the Milgram's acceleration. Only if the acceleration drops below this tiny number does this law begin to operate. Right? So with the higher accelerations, this law is fine. So if you do that, your A is equal to square root A naught times G. For G, I substitute my result GM over R squared. Now, A has to be matched by the centripetal acceleration, obviously, right, for balance. And I substitute here, V squared by R is A naught G over R squared. And lo and behold, R, R cancels. V becomes a constant. And so beyond a region of certain acceleration, the velocity, you get flat rotation curves, right? <laughs> so, you know, many people were quite charmed by this, quite taken by this, because it's very simple, right? You don't need any dark matter. Right. You don't have to puzzle over these things, right? You know, uh, you know, it's just you have to modify Newton's law. So there are two questions here. Right? One is how do you do this theoretically in a deep sense, right? You know, you have to embed it in some kind of theory, right? But forget about that. The more relevant question is how can one differentiate between these two hypotheses, namely dark matter and mod? And here again several decades after Milgram suggested this tantalizing idea, observations came to our rescue. And they were beautiful observations, I still remember them, you know, it happened about 15 years ago, they found two clusters colliding. Okay, before I go into that, let me tell you how this dilemma was resolved. What's the physics behind it? And the physics is gravitational density. So basically one can distinguish between real dark matter, which clusters, and a kinematic theory, such as mod using gravitational density. So what is gravitational density? You all know this, right? You know, almost a uh, hundred years ago, there was this very beautiful experiment carried out by Eddington, right? In the middle of the First World War, organized an expedition to Africa to see the deflection of light from a star and it was grazing the sun. And they found this beautiful deflection predicted by general relativity, right? This made, of course, Einstein's very famous, right? So we believe that, you know, dense object, right? It could be, and here's a beautiful uh, <laughs> a, uh, picture from the next, uh, that time, you know, it was in the New York Times, right? Einstein's theory triumphs, the hypers cube in the heavens, right? Nice cartoon here, right? Here's the sun, is the earth, is the star, right? So the basic thing to take away from this is that all of matter, all of matter, including dark and luminous, will bend light. So how do you use this as a test? What you can do is the following. So you've got this big cluster of galaxies right here, over here. You look at a galaxy very far, far away. Right? Here we are. We are on Earth here. What's going to happen to this galaxy is that rays of light in the absence of this cluster would have gone straight, will now be bent. They'll focus. Right? And so this galaxy will be slightly distorted because this cluster will behave like a gravitational lens. So I told you earlier this beautiful analogy, which is which I proposed between gravitational clustering and water, you know, and, and that was to understand clustering. And here is another analogy between light and gravity, uh, that of gravitational lensing. So nature was very kind to us because in 2006, people published a very dramatic photograph. Here's a photograph. Let me explain it. Right. 
and there was a paper and the title of this paper was very interesting a direct empirical proof of the existence of dark matter published by douglas crow and others in mj so what happened here is that 100 million years ago two clusters of galaxies collided this is a very rare event because clusters usually are spread out very far in space right and these two clusters all collided and a lot of physics happened there right you know the plasma clouds collided all the baryonic matter collided and they created a lot of shocks so the light curve here in 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 red and white right and yellow you can see a bullet shock here as the two plasma clouds pass by each other that's fantastic right that in itself is very gratifying and very interesting physics right you don't see it every day you know objects on such an enormous scale colliding but what was more interesting was they did a weak lensing survey right using galaxies far away to map the entire mass in this object and what they found was that the mass was localized not here but further off both for both clusters so there was a localization of mass here and this this was done by gravitational lensing right? which maps the full mass of the object right and this map showed that the dark matter there is definitely dark matter associated with this object because it is not interacting if this dark matter was in the form of baryons or stars it would have been sitting out here but it's moved ahead it can only move ahead if it's collisionless and so you know the balance then shifted away from mond like theories to mainstream dark matter but this dark matter had to be non baryonic so it didn't interact with normal matter so here it comes but it's very interesting that the idea of non baryonic dark matter also comes from big bang nucleus synthesis and cnb they both suggest this fraction of 4% let me go to big bang nucleus synthesis i'll be very brief here right because i believe somebody must have already given and discussed this with you so you know the universe today consists of lots of elements there is you know hydrogen helium of course very abundant elements but there is also gold there is potassium there is silicon most of those heavy elements were synthesized in stars but the light elements were synthesized in the original big bang and this entire synthesis of light elements took just about a minute so those of you who may have read this beautiful book by gamo the first 3 minutes will remember what i'm saying and those of you who have not please go and pick it up it's a very fine book gamo of course was one of the pioneers in this field george gamo russian scientist so what happens in these first few minutes is that you know prior to this you just have a mixture of protons electrons right and positrons the positrons are late about uh, you know less than a second before the big bang and then you have this primordial mixture of neutrons and protons neutrons start decaying into protons you know this you know reaction right it takes up for 11 minutes half time and also neutrons start combining with protons to form deuterium right deuterium is the lightest element here then you go on further this is all nuclear synthesis right you know it's like a pressure cooker things are being cooked there right not rice and dal but deuterium and tritium and ultimately helium 4 but the point is that deuterium is very difficult to make and easy to break the binding energy of deuterium is only about 2 mev okay contrast this with helium 4 for which the binding energy is 28 mev so no sooner that is deuterium made then it breaks up and so the abundance of deuterium in the universe today is very sensitive to the baryon density right so here is a picture here right now this is not a linear plot right now you start this is helium right the helium abundance is shown here the error boxes show the present abundance right and uh, the x axis is the baryon density right you find that the helium abundance is not too sensitive to baryon density right it goes from 0.2 to some point 4 but deuterium just look at it right it goes from 0.2 falls all the way below 10 to the power minus 5 right now so if you can measure it and people have measured it very firmly it's about here somewhere right right you can infer directly that the matter density was the, the baryonic density is about 4% right which is consistent with what you see from rotation curves and So here, I hope I've convinced you that the universe 
it is dominated by dark matter. But now we have a big problem, right? Because since it does not interact with normal matter, right? You know, protons, electrons, neutrons, you know, what is it? What is it? What could it be? Right? So most people believe it's a relic from the Big Bang. And two categories have been suggested for dark matter. One, it's WIMP, okay? and one is macho. So you can imagine who thought of these <laughs> adjectives, you know, nouns, WIMPs and machos, right? Anyway, they are actually quite appropriate. A WIMP stands for a weakly interacting massive body. Right? So this is an elementary body, right? But it's not massless, it's massive. Okay. And there are some examples here. Whereas a macho is a massive compact halo object. This could be a failed star, like a Jupiter object, which does not shine, right? Or a black hole. So let's, let's discuss these things separately, these ideas separately. So this is the point that, you know, you started with a big bang and, you know, as you go back in, in time, the universe becomes very interesting and more complex, right? Because, you know, different, different bits of particle physics come into play here, right? The physics becomes very different here from here, right? And so you believe, you know, if you believe in WIMPs, that you know some some relics out here kind of survived right? and became dark matter today. So an example of a relic that does exist, right, is a neutrino. What happens here? I'm giving you just an example of quantum electrodynamics, right? In quantum QED, you have such such reactions which are forbidden in classical electrodynamics. You can have two photons colliding and producing an E plus E minus pair, or just the reverse, right? Okay. Yeah. Why am I showing this? Because if you replace this by neutrinos, the photons by neutrinos, similar reactions happen, right? You can have, there's a channel, the weak channel, right? Which allows reactions like electron positron annihilation going into new, new E, new E bar. Similarly, the neutron, of course, you, as you know, decays into a neutrino, right? Electronic anti-neutrino, and, and so on and so forth. So if each neutrino, I think I've got another transparency here. Uh, yeah, this tells you the cross sections, you know, it, it's very nice physics here. I always teach it in my cosmology course, right? And these reactions take, they switch off at about 10th of a second after the Big Bang, before nuclear synthesis begins. And what is very interesting here is that if actually you calculate the number of abundance from entropy considerations, you get that every cubic centimeter in the universe has 108 neutrinos and antineutrinos. Now, compare this with the photon density coming from the cosmic microwave, right? They are very comparable. Right? So somebody, actually, Gerstein and Zadovich in the 60s asked the following question that, look, suppose you give a neutrino a tiny mass, what will happen? And the calculation is very simple. So you multiply this 108, uh, you know, neutrinos by a tiny mass and determine the density, right? So here is a calculation. You know, you know, multiplied by, say, divided by 10 EV, and you know you get this factor, you know this compared to this, and if I divide this by the critical density, I get it's 0.65 times the mass of the neutrino in terms of 10 eV. Right. So the neutrino has a 15 eV mass, then omega becomes unity. So in other words, the neutrino can easily play the role of dark matter. And recall, you know that you know, the neutrino, uh, you know. It's, it is being created, it is being destroyed, right, in the early universe. So nothing prevents it. There's no U on gauge symmetry, like there is in the case of the photon that prevents a neutrino from being mass, mass, massive, right? Photon has to be massive from the U on gauge symmetry. But the neutrino can have mass. So this was a very, uh, very uh, beautiful idea, right? And you know, other people, you know, Koshik and McClelland and, and, and uh, Alex Zale and Marx, they investigated it also in detail, right, in the 70s. But more recently, they found that actually observations indicate that the neutrino has a mass from neutrino oscillation. You find that it has a mass, but it's tiny. It's much less than 1 EV. So this possibility is actually true now. But this gives an example. You know, the reason I place this before you, A, because it was historically important, and B, it tells us that an elementary particle surviving from the Big Bang can play the role of dark matter. So now, you know, they said, okay, the normal neutrino cannot, as you know, neutrinos come in families, but there may be a fourth neutrino, right? The sterile neutrino. 
Now the sterile neutrino is called sterile because it's right-handed, or these are left-handed, and because it's right-handed, it does not interact by the weak force. It interacts, interacts solely by gravity. And, you know, the physics here allows it to have a large mass. Now, these results were very interesting because what happened is that in some of the models of a sterile neutrino, you know, if you have a 7 keV sterile neutrino, it will decay, you know, it's a kind of a quantum decay process to a left-handed neutrino and a photon. And this photon will be of 3.5 keV, it will give rise to a 3.5 keV line, which was actually discovered. This line was seen in Andromeda galaxy and in the Perseus galaxy cluster by means of the XMM Newton X-ray telescope. So there was a PRL, and in the same, a few months later, there was a beautiful ABJ, which confirmed this. You know, the ABJ took some 73 galaxy clusters, stacked them, and found the same line. So people said, hey, we've discovered dark matter. It's a sterile neutrino. But immediately a controversy erupted, which sometimes happens with these observations, because no such line was seen either in the Virgo cluster or in the Milky Way. And furthermore, this line is compatible, this line is compatible with emission from atomic transitions of potassium. Right? So it's the question is, this is called systematics in astronomy. Right? So is this a real thing or is this due to some other source? Right? You know? And um, this question is still unresolved, right? So, you know, it's not clear whether, you know, we've actually seen dark matter in this manner, of course. But this is not the only candidate for dark matter, right? So, you know, there are many other candidates, including neutralinos. These are neutralino is the lightest supersymmetric partner, you know. Um, and so it emerges, it's a neutral particle, so many people like it, right? There are also axions, right? And other candidates, right? And if uh, another interest, intriguing possibility is that if WIMPs are actually Majorana particles, that means the particle and the particle are the same, then two WIMPs colliding would annihilate and produce gamma. Now, this would show up in a significant gamma ray excess right, in the galactic hill. And in fact, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope launched, you know, sometime back, is searching for gamma rays from, even from various sources, but also from dark matter annihilation. So, you know, in fact, the survey actually saw an excess of photons from the central region of our galaxy. And the energy spectrum of these photons was much higher right, than the KV, it was in the GEP, it was gamma. So they said, wait a minute, these photons could arise from, you know, Majorana dark matter, and annihilating dark matter, or from gamma ray pulsars, right. So still this issue has not been resolved because again, there's a source of systematics, and that is maybe you have a new population of unresolved gamma ray pulsars who also emit in this. So you see, you, have, you might have astrophysical contaminants right, to your primordial signal. Right? You have to be able to model the galaxy very well in order to subtract one from the other. The same thing happened for the cosmic mi microwave background. You know, the cosmic microwave is a three degree background and the galaxy shines really brightly in all wavelengths and you have to subtract it away right, in order to get the primordial signal. So the same is true for dark matter signatures. But you can have a surprise any time because lots of teams are working on this. Those people who want more details on these experiments can check out these references. So now the thing is that even without worrying about what is dark matter, what is its nature, if it's a particle, then there are three possibilities. It's a very light particle, right? Less than 30 EV, you know, this is hot, called hot, right? And this is warm is a few keV. So, you know, your, your um, uh, sterile neutrino would be this or a cold dark matter particle more than a GeV. Right? And the reason people are interested in this is that the nature of dark matter influences the properties of the cosmic web. You know, and, I, and I'll tell you this because this is related to something called the free streaming distance. You know? So what happens is that due to collisional phase mixing or free streaming, dark matter particles stream you know, see, they, 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 
they are collisionless, right? So they can stream from overdense to underdense regions while they are relative distance. And the distance that they stream, right, is called the free streaming distance, right? Okay. And any scale below this free streaming distance gets wiped out. This is very important. So the distribution of density becomes a little smoother on scales smaller than this. And the free streaming distance is related to the mass of the particle in this manner, right? Lambda F is this formula below. So, you know, this is really a little cartoon I drew, right? So if you have, say, a light neutrino, it's going to free stream, you know, from this overdense region to this one. And this particular K mode will get wiped out. And so if you try to plot the power spectrum, which is kind of, you know, the Fourier transform of the density field, RMS, right? You know, for the cold dark matter, it has this form. Whereas, you know, if, if you have uh, a very light warm dark matter particle, half a keV, it will show, it will wipe out structure on these scales, right? So that's why also another reason why people were, became fond of warm dark matter, like stellar neutrinos, was coming from astrophysics. And astrophysics is the following that you see, if you have a purely cold dark matter, you know, with this kind of power spectrum, right? Then it faces some theoretical issues, right? You know, it's not clear right now if there are really serious problems, but there are issues involved. And one of those issues is all the substructure problem. And namely, if you are on a simulation of cold dark matter, right? Taking sufficient number of particles, right? Nowadays, computer simulations are really huge. You can take more than a billion particles, right? And if you simulate the region close to us, say this is the Milky Way and you know, Andromeda is nearby, then you find that the Milky Way will be surrounded by thousands and thousands of dark matter satellites. Right? You know, eventually many of them should turn into galaxies and you simply don't see so many objects associated with individual Milky Way or even Andromeda. So this is, uh, you know, known as the substructure problem. That there's just too much structure in a cold dark matter scenario. A related issue is that you know, if you if you again, uh, this is more of an analytical calculation that if you actually calculate the density profile in the central regions of galaxies, they are very steep, right? You know, it's it really, it, 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 it has a cusp, right? One over R profile, right? it gets very steep. But observations don't show this cusp. In fact, they show that the inner density, the, the density becomes a constant, the dark matter density, right? the inferred dark matter density becomes constant. So people said, well, you know, both of these problems can be solved if you have warm dark matter because it has this cutoff. And so you will immediately see an order of magnitude less, fewer satellites here. And you also not see this cusp, which is very nice, right? So this is kind of cosmologist telling particle physics physicists, right? There's always a jugalbandi involved here, right? You know, there's a crosstalk between people and uh, in working in different disciplines, right? But then people said that, hey, hang on, you know, this is really a dark matter simulation. What you really see in the universe are, are galaxies, and galaxies are baryonic objects, right? So suppose, you know, suppose you have, you're not taking into account stellar feedback here, right? You know, or supernova explosions, right? So, you know, in the early universe, maybe these things were abundant, right? And they kind of, you know, blew all these little tiny, tiny dots. I mean, these tiny, tiny dots do exist in dark matter, but the supernovae just blew the matter out of them, and you don't, then nothing forming there right now, right? So it's kind of, you know, like an optical illusion, right? They're there, but they're not reflected in baryons. So really, you know, it's not really clear whether, you know, baryons, uh, you know, really feedback mechanisms from energetic processes will resolve this issue or whether the properties of dark matter, uh, you know, need to be thought over. So right now, you know, to, just to end this, this section, the search for dark matter particles takes several forms. You know, one is the production of dark matter in collider searches. Right? This would be the best because then you could, you know, monitor your experiment, design it, but there are no results so far. The second is indirect detection either through dark matter decay or annihilation. Right? So decay is linear in density, annihilation is rho squared, clearly, right? Two particles colliding. And dark matter, therefore, decay has less directional dependence and also less amplification of regions of higher density than annihilating dark matter. So these, these are the kind of criteria these two. And the third is very interesting, and that's direct detection in sensitive Earth-based detectors, right? You know, and there have been many, many detectors so far, and Lux is perhaps the best one right now, right? 
is located in uh, it's a large underground xenon experiment it's located in the home state mine in the us it's underground and so you don't see a detection right you see the, what is plotted here is the wimp nucleon cross section so the wimps have to collide with nucleons to give a signal right a very weak signal you see the inter cross section is very small and still they see nothing and this is plotted with respect to the wimp mass so you know the 1000 gb all the way from here to here you see nothing Okay, and of course, uh, you know, a nice test of this dark matter hypothesis would be very nice because, you know, this would be a clear signal because, you know, you know, the sun is moving with respect within the galaxy, right? And the earth is moving with respect to the sun. So you should see a wimp, wind, right, towards us. And this wind will be larger in June when the velocity vectors of, uh, you know, the us, the planet Earth, with respect to this wind as anti-parallel than in December. So you should see this, right? You know, and some experiments claim to have seen the signal, but then, you know, uh, those were again very controversial. There's another possibility of dark matter and that is you might have just a scalar field. Now that's very intriguing also because, you know, you believe the inflaton is possibly a scalar field and maybe even dark energy. So if you just have a scalar field with a mass term, then as it comes here, it begins to oscillate and when it oscillates, its equation of state is zero, just like dark matter, so it clusters. So it may have some very interesting properties. I'll not talk about that in further detail here. So, so you have scalar fields and you have dark matter. Now let's come to machos. These are massive compact halo objects, Jupiters or black holes. And this would be the picture then of dark matter. It would not be smooth, it would be discrete. All right, here's a galaxy, here are globular clusters in red, and here are your Jupiters or black holes. Now, this possibility has now gained a lot of attention with the discovery of gravity waves. And in, from there, you know, also the inferred existence of black holes. Because you see, we already knew that black holes existed, right? The center of our galaxy is a supermassive black hole. And the center of lots of galaxies are enormous black holes. Black holes are ubiquitous, they are everywhere in the universe. But they were thought to be really massive, right? And now, with the discovery of gravity waves, they have discovered much smaller black holes, right? You know, the recent experiments have seen that black holes five to 50 times the solar mass exist, right? And they've been discovered simply through this experiment, right? You know, not experiment, cosmic experiment, you know, that two black holes, when they merge, they emit these gravitational radiation, which awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics a few years ago, right? And I believe you've got many lectures on this, so I'll go through this very rapidly. And there's the graveyard of black holes, right? All these two uh, progenitors have merged to this one. These two have merged to this one, right? And so you have lots and I mean, you could have many, many black holes in the universe, right? And what prevents them from being galaxies? So here is, is a nice picture. I like this one very much. You know? <laughs> so, you know, you have the first and the second black hole, and this is the scale picture, and this is the final black hole. So these black holes have, you know, masses of about 50 times the solar mass. And, you know, uh, the sun, if it became a black hole, of course it won't, would have a radius of three kilometers. So, you know, multiply that by 50 times, you get about 150 kilometers, right? So that's the size of these, this black hole. Right? And it emits a lot of radiation, right? In gravity, enormous amount of radiation. So, now, if our black halo actually does consist of numerous black holes, how, we did, how do we detect? How do we? It is, it is not shining directly. So at first time glance, you would say, man, this is a hopeless task. You just can't do it. This, this chap is not shining at all. But actually, we go back to lensing. Lensing comes to our aid again. Because you know that light, you know, a massive object like a black hole or even the sun, it bends space. And so light does not travel in straight lines, light curves around this object. And I already mentioned this beautiful experiment carried out uh, by Eddington, 1919, which proved this works, right? And so what you use now for detecting black holes or failed objects in, in the halo is microlensing. So microlensing is, you know, imagine you are located here and, and there is a distant star very far away and an object passes between you and the star. 
for, for a fraction of a second. Now, for that fraction of a second, the light from the star will get magnified. It will get lensed. Lensing means amplification. And so for a fraction of time, if you look at the brightness of the star, it will suddenly increase and then drop. And so this is what you do. This is a cartoon of what is going on. This is grab called gravitational lensing by a black hole. You've got a distant star. It's emitting light. And here's a black hole. You know, normally the star would look like this. But as the black hole comes between us and the star, ooh, the brightness in the star increases. And then the brightness decreases again once the black hole has passed. So you try and detect these objects, right? You, you know, you, you, you find, you, you look for gravitational lensing and the star that you look for is you know is the galaxy surrounded by so many neighbor galaxies right so you look at one of its neighbors m31 or you know or or some closer closer galaxy and look at the stars in that galaxy and this is what people found so so okay this is not only from there this is from all other sources what are the bounds on primordial black holes suppose you have a lot of black holes what are the observational bounds right and the observational bounds you know, somewhere here they come from lensing, but here also there's a lensing, and then they come from other other sources too. I'll not go into this experiment in detail, perhaps you've already seen this. But what is interesting here is that the ratio, allowed ratio, right, between the primordial black hole density and the dark matter, right? Now remember, this has to be a order unity. If all of black holes can be dark matter, it's close to unity, and, and, and this is actually, this, this has now gone away. This is like the older picture. You can actually go all the way to unity almost. In two regions, in two bands, one is a very heavy band, right? So if you have bl large black holes, massive black holes, about 50 times solar mass, you can close it, you can, you can have this. You can, all of them can be dark matter. Or if you have tiny, tiny black holes, right? Then it's about 14 times the solar mass, right? This is smaller than an asteroid, right? They're really tiny black holes, right? Like a dust grain mass black hole, right? Then also you can close, you can give rise to dark matter. So two windows for black holes can play the role of dark matter. But you may ask, well, how, how can you form so many black holes, right? Are they all formed from stars, right? And the answer here is, is very intriguing that actually quantum fluctuations during inflation could form such enormous numbers of primordial black holes and this is what I recently demonstrated with my PhD student, Swagat Mishra, in a JCAP article published just a couple of months ago. So in fact, now there are two channels for dark matter. And one is through black hole production, right? Either in the early universe or later. And one is through, um, through a map of weakly interacting massive particles. So this issue has become very exciting, very interesting, right? And in the next few years, you're going to see massive developments because, you know, you're going to see many more gravity wave events. As you know, there is the Indian Gravity Wave Observatory Indigo coming up here, right? And there are also space-borne observatories going to be launched, right? So you, you really, the search for black, primordial black holes will speed up, right, enormously. And also you will have, you know, maps of the universe plotting, you know, billions of galaxies. So that's really exciting. But um, if the nature of dark matter is uh, elusive, the issue of dark energy is still more exciting. And some might even call it perplexing. So this will be my talk tomorrow. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, <clears throat> we have some questions. Uh, I, I would uh, first take uh, questions on from the Zoom chat. So I will ask uh, uh, people to raise their hand. Uh, the first question is by Sadvik. Uh, Sadvik, can you uh, uh, unmute and ask your question? Hello, good afternoon, sir. My name is Sadvik. So my question is, is dark matter related to gravity? If yes, how is it is related to gravity? Well, if it's a black hole, it's definitely related to gravity because it gravitates, right? If it's, yes. Yes. yeah, but uh, you know, if it's, if it's a nuclear particle, right? Like a wimp, <coughs> it also gravitates, but it gravitates very weakly. 
but in, in the course of cosmic expansion you know billions of these particles merge right and form the halo and of course the halo of the galaxy gravitates that's how you find it right from its gravity so if it's elementary particles you need zillions of them to have a strong gravitational signature right you know and you see that in that bullet cluster for instance right you know but if it's a black hole you only need a few of them right to have a gravitational signature does that answer your question okay sir thank you yes uh <clears throat> there is a second question by uh, uh by madhusudan but his mic is not working so i will ask uh, on behalf of him okay uh, his question is when when did dark matter form in the universe did it the, the dark matter if there are particles or something were they formed before the normal baryonic matters or after yeah that's an intriguing question thank you for this question uh, you see it depends what is dark matter so if dark matter is an elementary particle like a neutrino right massive neutrino then these we believe that all the matter in the universe right was formed at the very early stages of the big bang possibly after inflation when the universe reheated right that gave rise to all kinds of matter baryonic non baryonic the then what different species of dark matter did after that depends on whether they were charged or they were neutral right or they decayed or they were not you know they, they were stable right you know so if it's a wimp typically if it's a weakly interacting massive particle then the bet is that it it has existed right from the big bang it's a very old relic of the big bang just like the cosmic microwave background right? but if it's a black hole then it could have you know come into existence much more recently black holes if they are astrophysical objects have to form after stars form right then stellar formation can be much more recent that's my answer uh the next question is by uh, yashodhan joshi yashodhan can you uh, unmute yourself and ask hello sir hello sir i wanted to ask that uh, is it possible that at large mass scales like galaxy or galaxy clusters the gravity behaves differently than newtonian or general relativity which can explain lensing or the rotations speed yeah. etc i understand your question this is a very nice very and it's a very apt question because one of the possibilities i didn't mention but i will mention in my talk tomorrow you know so you know, be there for it is that gravity weakens on large scales you know and uh, you know because it's the same question people ask that look you have tested gravity i mean this eddington's test of gravity was done on on solar system scales right and how do you know gravity is the same on on cluster scales right so people have tried to make what are known as modified theories of gravity which converge to general relativity on smaller scale but diverge from it on larger scales or even at earlier times because this issue of the big bang singularity is also a very perplexing issue and many people have said that well you know general relativity may not be a complete theory right because it gives rise to the big bang singularity maybe you need a more complete theory of gravity to remove the singularity right and so you may ask well maybe you know what could be this theory be so then two questions are right is is it a classical theory or is it a quantum theory right you know so even in the classical framework there have been several theories of modified gravity which have been put forward but none of them as far as i know it can explain dark matter some of them do explain dark energy but um i have not seen so far a satisfactory theory that could explain the existence of dark matter okay thank you so um the next question is by uh, vishwakanan vishwakanan uh, you have to unmute yourself um am i audible sir yes you are um sir if matchos are supposed to be a uh, dark matter particles then brown dwarfs and uh, black holes they are supposed to be made of baryonic matter like uh, if we go do by the theories that we have now yes. so if they are made of baryonic matter then how does it change the energy de the density of the baryonic matter which we have measured from the cosmological things and other stuff oh, uh, excellent question thank you very much for it you see the direct evidence for this 4% right comes from nuclear synthesis right but if black holes form a primordial right if black holes actually exist then they are they they, are, they can be made up of dark matter right if they are primordial right? 
you know, if they're not stellar. But if they are stellar and formed later, you, you are absolutely right. They would spoil our nuclear synthesis. Right? So I, I do believe that if, you know, if the black holes you see uh, form dark matter, then you know, in order not to violate nuclear synthesis, they should have formed long, long ago. That is, that is absolutely correct, right? Whereas you know, non-baryonic dark matter doesn't face this problem because it existed right from the time of the Big Bang. Jupiter's too will run into this problem. Because Jupiter's two are astrophysical objects, right? You know, collapse of objects, and you know they'll violate this four percent. So nobody takes the Jupiter's thing very seriously nowadays, right? Because this four percent is is really strong, right? So yeah, but your your question is very valid. Thank you for it. Thank you. Sir. Um, there is a, there is another question by Junik uh, Sen Gupta. Hello, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, am I audible? Yeah, speak louder, please. Uh, sir, am I audible now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sir, my question is that, uh, is it is this part uh, yet confirmed that or, or being predicted like how dark matter interact among themselves, like between dark matter, dark matter, what happens in there, uh, what is their nature, how does they interact among each other in themselves? Is this part being predicted or like uh, something has been worked on this? Yes, of course, because you see, you see, if dark matter exists, and if it's non-baryonic, then it's beyond the, to look for it, you have to go beyond the standard model. You know, even the fact that the neutrinos have mass, you have to go beyond the standard model. You know, use some seesaw mechanism or something else, right? I mean, you invoke a sterile neutrino. So, you know, people working on particle physics issues, you know, related to dark matter, you know, they, they invoke a particle and then naturally you, you have, you know, you develop this Lagrangian, you develop the quantum theory. And that tells you how this matter interacts some. How, how this matter interacts, right? You know, just like I mentioned that some of these matters, if it's a Majorana particle, then the particle antiparticle would annihilate, you know, and give rise to photons, which you might see. Right? So all that is worked out, you know, the cross-section of dark matter annihilation, for instance, or, or dark matter decay, right? Means that you understand the property of this dark matter very well, you know, within the framework of your theory, you know, whether it is supersymmetry or it is some other theory, you know, Sure, but this is a question actually for particle physics. We have uh, one last okay. question. Uh, the last question is uh, from YouTube uh, by Anudeep. The question is <clears throat> to finally uh, pin down what exactly dark matter is, what kind of observational and experimental uh, 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 observational and experimental uh, evidences that we would need to finally pin it down. Yeah. Well, you just need one sure evidence, one sure evidence. That's it. You don't need more. Right. I would be very happy. If one of these underground experiments saw a positive signal, you know, if you see a five, six Sigma signal, right. Of, uh, you know, dark matter interacting with the nucleon in a specific way with a specific cross section on a specific mass scale, it would be a discovery. You know, and you've seen how far people have progressed with neutrinos. I mean, neutrinos interact very, very weakly with matter, right? There are a trillion neutrinos going through my hand right now from the sun. They are not interacting with my hand, right? And yet people have constructed very complex and beautiful experiments for detection of neutrinos, right? So an experiment like that on Earth would be wonderful, right? You know, so, you know, if you could detect a, a particle, a dark matter particle, through a big experiment, that would be the best because then you could modulate it, you could fine tune that experiment, you could own it, you know, just like they've done for the cosmic microwave background. First, the discovery came in, you know, uh, Penzias and Wilson, right, uh, long ago, right, and then people discovered it and then they honed it in. Now they know the CMB to fantastic accuracy, right, but so far the discovery itself has been elusive, right, you know. So this is for a particle, if it's an elementary particle like a WIMP. But if it's actually a black hole, then, uh, you know, you have to, I mean, you have to think of other ways, you know, microlensing is again a very nice option, right? Look for lots of microlensing signatures, right? You know, if they work out, but it depends on the mass of the black hole. If it's a large one, it will give you a, a nice uh, microlensing signal. But if it's tiny, right, less than a gram, then you have, to, you have to be innovative essentially, right? Astrophysical experiments, for astrophysical experiments, you have to be, you know, think in a different way 
and from particle experiment physics experiments you know your, your kind of thought process is slightly different the experiments are designed in different ways but uh, you know I, i really hope that within the next decade you know some some signature comes by it. some annihilation which is unambiguous you know suppose i get a signature that okay dark matter is annihilating here and i have this firm line in, in say 10 gv right gamma ray is coming to me and it's not predicted by any astrophysical object nothing emits in this line then that's it then i would be very happy i would be quite satisfied right if again the signal is uh, confirmed at some five sig so it depends on the nature of dark matter what it and what it interacts with what are its decay channels uh, i think uh, 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 we are done for today with the questions there were some questions which were asked in the beginning of the talk All right. and i think the talk answered those questions okay automatically and then there were some questions which are related to dark energy so maybe they should be taken tomorrow yes i think we have so uh, so we should thank the speaker for for this great talk okay thank you all very much